Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to take part, and thank you so much for this first talk, uh, Professor uh, Smith. It was uh, really inspiring. Um, I'll be talking about something rather different, perhaps, though I think there are uh, complementarities, but I'll be talking from a quite different perspective. Uh, I'm a postdoc fellow at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. I've uh, been living there since uh, October. Uh, I'm from Denmark. Uh, I what used to work as a teacher and in professional development of teachers in Denmark for some years uh, before I uh, pursued uh, an academic career. Did my PhD in, in Bristol, UK, uh, and I've been a postdoc at UC Levin, just outside Brussels for, for some years as well, and now living in, um, in Krakow, as I mentioned. Um, yeah, so thank you so much again for inviting me to, to come here um, and, and share some reflections um, about uh, learning and teaching and policy and how to create meaningful change. Um, learning and teaching is always about ideas and values, about society, projecting the future, and representing the past here and now. So no surprise that the pursuit of meaningful challenge uh, uh, meaningful change in education is challenging and contested. And in the current situation uh, with armed aggression and war uh, raging, not, uh, raging not far away, we are indeed are reminded that if truth is the first victim of war, then education is likely to feel the repercussions of war soon after internationally. And here I'm thinking not only about the sanctions, uh, but also about the daily interactions, the uh, inflow of new students arriving, uh, and the daily interactions in, in school systems. Uh, I would like to make a, a few observations based on my experiences from teaching, uh, action research, and professional development uh, with a focus on students with migrant background in Denmark and England. Um, of course, you'll always find cultural diversity among students in classrooms just as diversity of class uh, or socioeconomic background. Uh, however, in my view, the, the presence of students who were born abroad or whose parents were born abroad uh, and perhaps speak a different language at home than the language of instruction in schools tend to throw the ordering and structuring impulse of education systems into sharp uh, relief. Uh, my observations are rather impressionistic in nature but together they will hopefully form a patchwork uh, with a message that corresponds with the title of what I'm presenting here, Stock Between Practice and Policy, uh, Reflections on Cultural Diversity, Learning and Teaching. So back in the early 2000s, uh, I taught in Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, young migrants and refugees who had just uh, arrived to Denmark. They needed and they were strongly motivated to learn Danish and different subjects in Danish to get on with our lives in Denmark. Uh, as a teacher, I got involved in a project about learning language across the curriculum. In the early 2000s, that was a new thing in Denmark, inspired by experiences from abroad, uh, like the US, for example. Uh, a few months after the project was completed, the municipality in Copenhagen launched a major professional development initiative where over a few years, uh, around 1,000 teachers should take part in a 50 hours course on teaching methods focusing on language learning across the curriculum. Importantly, this approach was meant to be relevant to in the teaching of all students, not only those speaking Danish as a second or additional language. A third of students in primary and secondary schools in Copenhagen at that point had an ethnic minority background, speaking other languages as, as well as Danish when they arrived in school. Um, forming part of a team of instructors this was my first experience with professional development of teachers. It was a massive investment, and the municipality expected results. The professional development courses did not stand alone, were part of efforts in school development, and the municipality had for some years built a very strong department with a specialist in this particular area. Many of the courses, uh, many of the teachers, sorry, taking part in the courses were pleased, uh, not everybody were happy, and some criticized that the courses were mandatory. In these years, there was a distinct movement in Denmark towards more coordinated professional development at the local level, rather than leaving it to teachers alone to choose the sort of professional development they wanted. In addition, 
there were frictions between the local and national policy levels. The Danish government at that time profiled itself on a national liberal agenda, promoting Danish values as well as new public management market ideas and more standardized testing. The national agenda and the local one in Copenhagen were pulling in different directions. It's safe, it's safe to say that the national politics eventually came to dominate. Ten years later, uh, in the early 2010s, the municipal department of specialists in Copenhagen was shut down. The times and the language about education had changed towards assuming that Danish as a first language is the norm and therefore less focused on language resources that students who speak Danish as a second language uh, bring with them to school. So even a small country, and that's really my point, like Denmark, with less than six million people, you have frictions from time to time between local and national agendas. And repeatedly, the frictions have been associated with the understanding of cultural diversity and whether and how learning in schools should acknowledge the diversity, religion, language, and so on, in Danish societies and beyond. A few years later, I learned that there had been a sort of professional uh, network and exchange be between professionals in Copenhagen and London already during the 1980s, when the Inner London Education Authority was pursuing multicultural education, partly inspired by ideas in New York City. Much to the delike, dislike of the UK government, headed at that point by Margaret Thatcher, uh, the uh, Inner London Education Authority had to fold in 1990. Uh, subsequently, uh, the local education authorities in England has lost much of the capacity to set an educational agenda as well demonstrated in the literature. At that point, I speculated that local decision making is better because they are more directly accountable to the pe people living in an area. This was probably naive. But in any case, two examples of the nation state asserting itself in systems where there used to be more scope for local agency, the nation state asserting themselves in a globalizing world. And there you have it, stuck between different levels of policy, pulling in different directions, students with migrant background and professionals trying to negotiate different demands, often all too aware that the curriculum did not allow sufficient scope for taking the students' resources into account. As far as I know, that's a research agenda, agenda which has been hindered at, but not sufficiently explored. Making sense of the relations between national and local decision making in a globalizing world and the cultural engineering and boundary drawing undertaken by the state to remain relevant. A random definition of inclusion, the idea that everyone should be able to use the same facilities, take part in the same activities, and enjoy the same experiences, including people who have disability or other disadvantage. Terms such as inclusion might take on new and somewhat distorted meanings. Both in Denmark and England, the idea of inclusion was introduced, though years apart, along with the further uh, undermining of the subject areas of English and Danish as a second or additional language. And hence a strengthening of the norm that all learners share the same mother tongue, the language of instruction, though they obviously don't. In England, there's furthermore the long-standing tradition of setting where students are divided into groups in the core subjects based on their abilities. Some years ago, I wrote about my experiences working as a teaching assistant in a school in England, including my observation that students who struggled to communicate in the language of instruction uh, would often be found in the groups not doing so well academically in school. When teachers struggled to maintain a sense of structure in such classrooms, the result was that these students were in a classroom situation where teachers tried to minimize interaction rather than nurture it for learning and communicative purposes. Uh, 
The initiative in Copenhagen to launch a major de professional development program was given momentum by international surveys and assessments. Especially the PISA 2000 results expose a distinctive systemic failure where students born in Denmark to parents born outside Denmark, so-called second generation migrants, um, in Denmark were not doing better than the first generation in the brand of literacies promoted by the OECD. I think Denmark and Belgium were the only systems in PISA at that point that had this particular issue. The findings caused quite some debate back then, and parts of the professional community, despite some skepticism about the paradigm underpinning the PISA and the methodological nationalism that is pitting nation state against nation state through the rankings, uh, parts of the community certainly embraced these findings in the hope that some meaningful action would be taken. In a way, it was a perfect example of the OECD's policy-driven research being a potential uh, resource highlighting issues deemed controversial in national systems. Yet, in the end, it mainly turned out to be yet another example of a government, in this case the Danish one, cherry-picking findings and after an OECD country review on top of that, introducing an evaluation culture that they had already thought about. The OECD's PISA is just one of the many manifestations of globalization when it comes to education policy, research, higher education, and indeed educational practices in schools. Globalization and Europeanization, the exchange of ideas, mobilities and networks that come with them are accelerating and inspiring in so many ways, expressed in a conference like this one too, although it's all too clear that globalization more widely also comes with huge costs and inequalities. Moreover, globalization adds complexity, confusion, and noise. In the increasingly globalized fields of education and policy making, with an abundance of data, digital innovation speeding up, and a vast range of actors, public, private, and everything in between, which seek influence at multiple levels in the name of public interest, advocacy, and or business, and try to reach into schools and classrooms and having a say on what educators and teachers ought to do and students ought to learn, there is an acute risk for uh, professionals being swept away by the amount and intensity of information, opportunities, and demands that are difficult to reconcile. I can't help thinking of a science teacher I observed as part of an action research project at school in Copenhagen. Time and again, she would do simple and effective things that would engage the students in a wonderful manner. When I would ask her where she got those ideas from and her assumptions about how her ideas would play out in action, she, and this will probably not surprise you, would find it difficult to formulate an answer. But she clearly knew what she was doing. What space is there for the educator's tacit knowledge today? Recalling Michael Polanyi's catchphrase that we can know more than we can tell. Education is a public good, and I'm certainly not advocating the idea that educational issues should be left to educators alone to address. But at the same time, there remains a need for dialogue among professionals to reflect on what is hard to express. This is especially the case when it comes to the teaching and learning of students that do not correspond with the norms and assumptions underpinning systems, such as those whose first language is different from the language of instruction, to men just mention just one group among many. So, what holds together this rudimentary narrative <laughs> that I tried to put forward here? Um, let me try to wrap up uh, by suggesting that the observations about conflicting demands from multiple policy levels, different agencies in the field, the distortions of language, like a term of inclusion, the globalizing pressures and opportunistic use of whatever findings shoot an interest, exemplify some of the major challenges facing educators and the teaching profession today. For the teaching profession to maintain a sense of urgency, uh, agency <laughs> a sense of voice and to counter the fetishing, uh, fetishizing of data and rankings, the fixation with quick fixes and reputational risk, uh, 
and the drive towards privatization and com uh, commercialization in education sectors, there needs to be some sort of mobilization informed by educational theory and philosophy, a foundation of specialized knowledge nurtured through critical and constructive dialogue with colleagues and fueling the communication with policymakers, parents, and other parties, and of course, in the practices with students. Without theory, there are only opinions. As Roger Dale, British sociologist of education, and my PhD supervisor would put it. Historically, teaching has as a profession been organized in a flat and egalitarian manner in many systems. Given the scope and complexity of demands, the level of stress among educators as well as school leaders, being overwhelmed with too many tasks, and the recruitment and retention issues in many systems, it would seem worth thinking creatively about career stages and pathways, and about whether the distribution of task responsibilities and leadership could be organized differently. Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you so much. Very interesting. And uh, lots of uh, theories from Pierre Bourdieu and Farclaw came to life in my mind when you were talking about the second language and so on. Uh, we have a few minutes, let's say 10. If anyone has any questions for our keynote speakers from the first plenary this morning, now it's the time to ask those questions. Maybe we, you would like to use the expertise of Professor Smith or uh, Dr. Tore Sorensen. Do you have any questions for our speakers this morning? Oh, excellent. I'll come with the microphone. Uh, yes, thank you for the two excellent um, talks. Very informative. I was enlightened. See, I praise. My question would be, since we know all this stuff about how kids work, right, and we try as adults to understand their ways, albeit we are flawed and we sometimes learn from them more than they, more than they learn from us, the question would be, if we really want to help them, can't we just, I know it's not easy, can we just uh, short circuit the whole political issue and create a poll, uh, some sort of um, institution that actually has weight when it comes to decision making at a political level, like not a union, some sort of a voice, but that, that has absolutely no connection to any uh, influences from outside. Now, I, I know I'm placing too much hope on adults because we tend to have this need, but can there really be something that we can do to actually help uh, our students. I mean, you, you mentioned millions of people having, of children having uh, bullying problems in um, uh, in the states. That's if we look at the world, we know that it's bad. We see our kids failing tests and and all that. Can is there any vision of this, like a revolution, when it comes to actually helping the kids? Thank you. So I like that question. Um, as a practitioner uh, and theorist, I guess, folks like to call us scholars a lot in the United States, um, I think one of the issues is that communities um, and uh, civic governments fight pretty hard to have as much localized control as possible over their children's education. Depending on the system that you're in, uh, there can be what many consider somewhat of a balance between some sort of federal or national control and more localized regional control, or there can be kind of too much weight on one side of the other. I think what we've seen in terms of education reform um, in the matters that I'm discussing in particular regarding safety is that a, an individual child's safety or a group of children's safety uh, is largely going to be in the hands of the responsible adult supervising them, 
almost irregardless of what policies or the amount of funding that exists. Um, the, uh, Dr. Espinage uh, at, in North Carolina in the United States um, has written over 250 articles on bullying alone. And uh, one of her more recent articles talked about how well most anti-bullying bullying policies haven't really worked very well. And even when we think about what works, we have a reduction in reported bullying, <laughs> but we don't necessarily have evidence that children's safety have dramatically increased. Um, so in terms of your question of is there maybe one entity that we can create, um, the more entities that we create that are supposed to supervise these very loosely coupled um, locations of, of instruction are going to have to still deal with the lack of skill, the lack of capacity, some of the issues my colleague just mentioned in, in terms of the available uh, resources and support for educators and the distraction away from their daily responsibilities, we're still going to have to deal with that. So um, uh, I didn't get to the ways that are recommended to actually make a dent, but many of them are programmatic and professional development oriented but also in partnering with organizations that are outside the school. We see these examples in Sweden, we see these examples in Lebanon, we see these examples uh, even uh, in, uh, gosh, former Swaziland, I think it's Eswatiti now. Um, so we see these examples of educational organizations partnering with other NGOs that specialize in human welfare and psychological well-being and forming partnerships to have those folks working directly with students and staff in the school to provide the support that states often don't. But uh, in the end, just as how proud we are when our students do well because of our partnerships with them in our classrooms, we also have to remember that their safety is also our responsibility in those classrooms, right? That their safety, as much as we celebrate how good our schools can perform, uh, how students' lack of safety perpetuates throughout our systems is also the responsibility of us in the schools. Uh, and the role that these entities play, these governing and supervisory entities play, can be one of increased support for professional development and affirming up of structures of supervision and accountability. We, we, we can't have students being violated by paid employees with literally no accountability for those very employees and then say that it's a mystery as to how unsafe students are. So we have critical dysfunctions that have to be solved, yes, definitely at the policy level, but at the most important levels of accountability, which is where students are encountering each other and when they're encountering, encountering adults. That, that's, that's my perspective on it. Yeah. Okay, I, I can uh, add a few other uh, aspects to that. I hope, um, yeah, so this idea of let's building an entity um, promoting the idea of, of educators and education. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the teacher workforce educators is also a very diverse group. And uh, I think that uh, Reverend Connell, the Australian sociologist, uh, she has a very strong point that throughout history, teachers uh, has often been a conservative force, stabilizing systems, but also uh, uh, being carrying out the agenda of, uh, of, of uh, state authorities. And so, of course, you'll have different movements among teachers, and, and there will always be disagreement. So in this way, having an, an entity, uh, it would certainly have, I think the most important is to enable uh, a critical uh, discussion and dialogue among educators. And, and of course, there are many fora uh, for that uh, already, so that as I, as I tried to, to say in my, in my talk, that so that educators have the chance to, to develop their knowledge base together and to somehow build a bulwark <laughs> against, the, against the flood of information and demands that is uh, coming over the, the profession. Uh, 
Um, I would like to mention uh, an ex um, uh, uh, initiative in Sweden where they tried to introduce a so-called first teacher that would have some kind of uh, middle management responsibilities in, in schools, and I think that's an interesting idea, and you can criticize many things about that initiative, and uh, it's very interesting to, to read about, because of course it, it caused some controversy that, oh, you had this very egalitarian uh, country, Sweden, and you had a very flat, flatly organized profession like teachers, and then you tried to introduce a hierarchical, a, sense, a new sense of uh, distribution of labor, and that uh, in itself, of course, caused some uh, controversy. But there was a very interesting point made some, by some researchers who, who looked into the, the outcome of this reform of first teachers. It was launched in the, in mi in the mid 2010s. And they said that actually, by having a better organization of tasks in schools, uh, it would give more autonomy <laughs> Uh, for the profession as a whole because uh, people would not be running around in the same degree as chicken trying to do uh, what they think should be done and being stressed and overwhelmed and uh, in the end not very happy about their jobs. So I, I think there's certainly an organizational aspect to how can you create fro uh, a forum in schools and between schools to mobilize the profession and and where the distribution of tasks in, in, in schools could be certainly one way of, of thinking about it. Of course, there's a lot of issues about how should you, um, who should decide, who should uh, take a step up the, the career ladder in this way and became a so-called first teacher, lead teacher, whatever you want to call it. Um, in Sweden, there are some commercial enterprises that have been involved in, in quite influential in working out uh, the assessment criteria and of course, you say, okay, where did that come from? Um, so that's not, that's certainly been very criticized, but thinking in organizational terms about how can we sustain and strengthen the dialogue between educators uh, on a daily level uh, seems like a huge, uh, there's some potential there, I would say. Thank you, we have last one question. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Derek and Tori for your, both your stories and I, I'm very much in favor of discretion and professionalization um, and building up of capacity of, of uh, uh, you know, creating your own space for not aligning with what is expected of you um, necessary. But my question is on the role of the welfare state. And you both, of course, come from very different uh, uh, situations where we, we would say in Belgium, the US has no welfare regime and, and, and Scandinavia is often seen as Walhalla, which is also not uh, always true, of course. But what, what do you see as the role of the welfare state in relation to, to the development of this, this problem? And I refer to the book of Margalit who wrote in the 80s, a book called Decent Society, and says we build humiliating societies. And you might say that the way we build schools and educational system might be humiliating and bullying in itself. So we need a d different idea of how we structure society. And could you say something about what you see the role of, of a welfare state, which is more than funding and, and regulating things, I think, but also is about installing an idea about humanity. Yeah, that's uh, an excellent question, of course, and thanks for that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, in my perspective, if you think about education as a, as a public good, um, some and, and that there is indeed a role for a profession in the education sector, um, a profession that probably needs to be strengthened and where there needs to be uh, consolidated uh, a knowledge base uh, and it needs to be maintained and developed all the time uh, corresponding with the change of, of times um, and a sense of autonomy for that profession so that they can actually carry out their work without too much intrusion from all those who try to make a business out of education sectors uh, and who all have interests and you can't, let's say, blame that there will be uh, enterprises and all sorts of organizations trying to, to influence uh, what, whatever sector that they find uh, interesting to, 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 to look into. 
and, and there I think that there's certainly a role for the welfare state. There needs to be regulation um, that protects education sectors in this way um, and draws boundaries about how can you uh, how can you shape what is going on in education sectors. Professional is autonomy is something granted by the state drawing a line somewhere, somewhere not drawing it at all, um, and overwhelming educators and teachers uh, with, with too many demands and imposing reform after reform and never letting anything uh, uh, settle. When I think about, and, and this relates to a question I believe, this notion of professional autonomy, there's a lot of literature now talking about, oh, the accountability, the onslaught of accountability, the under, under, uh, accountability policy movement that is undermining uh, education sectors as part of welfare systems. There's sometimes the notion that, oh, that before there didn't used to be accountability, but of course there should have been, <laughs> maybe there wasn't, but I would like to think, well, there was a notion of professional accountability where professionals would not be alone well, too often they were, but they should be accountable also to each other. I mean, and often the parallel would be the medical sector, uh, doctors being accountable to each other and thereby building a, uh, a professional community. I mean, so that you are accountable for your actions and in the way that, okay, can you, can you clarify and explain why do you do as you do in classrooms to watch your colleagues um, as, uh, as fellow professionals. And in this sense, professional accountability is certainly uh, tot completely central in terms of thinking about education as, as part of the, the welfare state, where uh, educators are, of course, also accountable in other ways, but they should certainly also be accountable to, to, each, other, so to each other. And there should be a, a forum where you'll be able to discuss uh, matters of uh, professional interest and it seems to me that uh, there's too little uh, scope for that when you look at how stressed uh, people are with different demands. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement of uh, most of what my colleague just mentioned. Um, so the United States is a special place. <laughs> okay. Uh, a country that touts itself as the greatest country in the world for no apparent real reason um, and most of the great things that are democratic about the United States were, were victories won by the working class. Right? Um, so there are great things about my country, but I, I know where they come from, um, which is also good. So I'll, I'll be brief, but the, so the understanding of the, the notion of the welfare state in the United States has always been a very contentious idea and concept and contentious by E evoking immense conflict and, and bloodshed for many generations now. Um, uh, my, my, my simplest example is that, um, so <clears throat> quickly, quickly, Derek. Okay, so quickly. In, um, so uh, coming out of the civil rights uh, era, uh, late 1960s in the United States, some of you are familiar, most of you are familiar with probably Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement, et cetera. Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968, um, which marked a shift in social movements in the United States uh, to where there was a division definitely in the black community, remembering that the black community in the United States was largely the vanguard for civil rights movements uh, from the mid-1920s um, into, <coughs> into present in many ways. But so when we think about that death of Martin Luther King and kind of a very almost assimilationist idea of people getting along and coming together, um, that began to erode uh, in, the, in the laboring and working classes of color in the, in, in the United States, which led to a more self-defense oriented approach to social justice that was also referred to as militant. This is where you got the Black Panthers, the Brown Berets, the Young Lords, the Students for a Democratic Society, all these different movements. So why would I bring all that up? Well, 
But something else happened in 1968, which was a, a great labor strike against General Electric. In, in, in 1968, during the Democratic Convention, you also had a huge uh, riot that was largely provoked by the Chicago Police Department, and it was televised. Okay, so why would I bring all this stuff up? Is because it was in 1970 where the Nixon administration uh, declared that much of the unrest that was occurring in the United States was due to a combination of people uh, being um, galvanized in class-based movements, but also having access to higher education, low, cheap, free, cheap and free access to higher education in which they were learning radical ideas, okay? Thus was passed this, uh, the uh, Crime and Safe Streets Act of 19, I think it was 72, but I think it was 19, uh, between 70 and 72, in which diverted funds away from education and in, into the development of our Americans' notorious uh, criminal justice system. All right, which took our penal system from 200,000 people in prison in 1970 to 2.6 million people in prison by 2006, okay? During this time, there was a defunding of educational efforts because education, through this idea of providing quality access of education to all of these historically marginalized peoples was becoming a threat to the conservative ideas of the United States. Okay, so when we think about the welfare state and the idea of education as a uh, public good, what has been negotiated over time is how do you still push for a high quality, empowering education for a very historically marginalized working class in the United States when the federal government has already had several decades of history of challenging the investment in education to, to prevent that very large population from becoming well-educated, okay? And then the other question becomes the influx of privatization, as my colleague was mentioning, in urban areas is one demonstration that many working class folks have felt that the public school system as a result of these generations of repression and defunding have now become insufficient. So now charter management organizations and private entities have been able to sweep in and provide an alternative form of public education that is largely private to, uh, privately managed, okay? So in that, when we talk about the welfare state and its role in education in the United States, we want to understand that the idea of the welfare state in the United States is seen as a bad thing to many citizens, okay? And it's been seen as a political, economic, a political and economic problem by the United States federal government for at the very minimum officially 40 years, okay? So that's kind of my perspective on that role. I mean, idealistically though, uh, any form of education should be empowering in creating the ideal human being. That's my belief, yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Eva Dombrova, uh, the wonderful co-host and the superhero of microphone handling. <laughs> Come back to us, please. Uh, okay, I think we're going to take a 10-minute break now uh, for a coffee that is served in the corner. Uh, so we go out of the room and to the corner where you see big windows. That's where the coffee station is. And we return 5 past 11 to resume our uh, morning plenary. Thank you so much. And During the break, I can put also the presentation uh, of our next keynote speakers uh, on the computer. With our plenary sessions, and we have uh, three keynote addresses in this part by Professor Rudy Rus, by Professor Mahesh Ts, and by Professor Vishnia Rajit. So, uh, without further ado, I would like to invite our first keynote speaker for this session. 